Wow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you having fun? What a wonderful, wonderful day of worship. Thank you to all of our, our volunteers and leaders. Thank you for the music and the prayers, the story, the children's story. Stacy, thank you for the piano and Jaylene and our worship team. What a blessing. Um, let's pray. Father, we just want to continue in this joyous spirit of celebration and love and fellowship. And God, as we direct our attention uh, to you, Father, with uh, this moment that we have to get into the Bible and into our lives and just thinking about what you want from us and for us, Lord, um, we just uh, ask that you would come, that our ears would hear, and that our hearts would be filled with your words. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath. Good to be with you. It's uh, getting to that point of the year where we're getting into the holidays and the cooler temperatures here, and it's just such a wonderful time uh, uh, here in Phoenix and to be able to worship together. Um, the title of my message is, You Are What You Eat, as you can see. Do you believe that? Now, if that's true... In a couple of days, virtually everyone here is going to turn into pumpkin pie and mashed potatoes and gravy, and cranberry sauce, a well-basted turkey or tofurkey or other uh, uh, protein that you might be consuming. This is something that we're familiar with in our nomenclature, and it's, a lot of us identify with this, this axiom of you are what you eat, largely with what kind of our parents told us growing up which was a way of saying if you eat unhealthy, you're going to be unhealthy. Whereas if you finish your plate, if you eat your vegetables, George, if you finish the, the good stuff, you're going to be healthy. Uh, but there's a lot more to this, this really, uh, this truth that it is. You are what you eat. There's a deeper uh, reality to it. And um, uh, that's what I want to tie in today a little bit, obviously in, in uh, connection with the feast that we're all planning for, most of us, I would think, when it comes to Thanksgiving, which is known for that very special meal. So we're going to have a little fun this morning, but not with the clicker because it doesn't work. And Toby's going to help me out with the mic. And if another one would be willing, Owen. Thank you. We're going to do our children's story. Let me see if it's working on my end. Okay, good. Thank you. I think it's working. All right, we're going to just get into our kids quiz. Again, if you've been here at any time, you you realize I like to have this little interactive, interactive time with the young people. Um, so raise your hand. Uh, we got Owen and Toby that will bring the mic so it can get recorded and so everyone can hear it. There's going to be several questions. He sold his birthright for a pot of beans. And I saw the boys over here raise their hand pretty quickly. So we're going to give Eric a chance here. Who are we talking about? Esau. He's right, Esau. This is the story that just keeps on giving, too. No matter how many times you evaluate this uh, e event, but... This is, you know, these brothers are famous for this one moment, among others, but when Esau and Jacob basically did a not nice thing, but Esau didn't do a wise thing when he sold his inheritance, his birthright for uh, not even beans, actually, lentils, worse than beans, sold his birthright. Number two, second one, he, who are we talking about here? He ate honey out of the carcass of a dead lion. True Bible story, by the way. True story. He ate honey out of the carcass of a dead lion. I saw Anna put her hand up. Oh, and that would be your sister, just so you know. Samson. She knows this story. That's right. The character of Samson. He actually, he does that, and it's kind of an interesting, dramatic moment in the life and story of Samson that plays into his narrative. So kind of gross, but uh, when you think about the character of Samson and you know the story, that is part of it. All right, this one I worded a little different. It delighted her eyes, and she thought it would make her wise if she ate it. Who are we talking about? Was this Jezebel, Delilah? I see a young lady right up here. Eve, Rebecca, who are we talking about? Eve. Eve is correct. Tried to, you know, if I said who ate the forbidden fruit, it's just a little too clear. I tried to make it a little bit more uh, of a challenge, but couldn't fool you. You got it. That's right, Eve. Again, that first moment of rebellion here on planet Earth, and it all had to do with Eve eating something. The devil tried to make Jesus turn this into bread. 
Was it manna, a fish, Peter, a stone? All right, uh, Dylan had his hand up there. Let's give Dylan. I'm sorry if I missed. Sorry, brother God at Isaiah. A Let's stone. Just, oh, sorry. Is that what you were going to say, Isaiah? All right, the brothers, we sorted it out. You want to an answer too? All right, Owen, you got one more coming right here. A fish. It is actually a, the, the stone was the right answer, but that was a good, good try. Jesus does some things with fish too, but it was a stone that the devil pointed to and said, you could do it. And Jesus said, that's not God's plan. I think I have one more. He, I have two more. He ate locusts and another honey one. He ate locusts, which are like big grasshoppers, right? You know what those, those locusts? He ate locusts and honey as part of his prophetic diet. Elijah, Elisha, John the Baptist, or John the Revelator. Who are we talking about here? I see Dylan's hand. I want to see if we have anyone else that wants to help out with this part of the service today. All right, Isaiah wanted. Oh, uh, Caleb, go ahead. You're right there. Okay. Elijah? Is that who you said? Wrong. <laughs> I'm just playing with you. <laughs> it's a good guess. It's kind of like related to Elijah, you could say. What do you say, Isaiah? D. What's that? D. D, John the Revelator? I don't know who your parents are. They're teaching you wrong. <laughs> that is wrong truth there. All right, we have someone over here. Yes. C. Hey, he said C, and he's correct. It was John the Baptist, who is kind of like the new Elijah, Caleb. I'll give you some, some credit. Jesus said he is the Elijah who is to come. So John the Baptist, odd guy, odd guy, John the Baptist. Even by the strange days of Israel's, uh, you know, when that was happening, John was a different sort of character. But uh, the Bible talks about that unique practice, wearing uh, the old biblical camel's hair uh, outfit and eating out in the wilderness that which he could find of locusts and honey. Yummy! By the way, potluck next week, lots of locusts and honey so we can all eat the diet of a prophet. Man, I don't know. Last question, young people. Last question. These are all true from the Bible. He ate scrolls. He ate scrolls. Who are we talking about? Did any of you grow up, well, maybe you don't want to raise your hand because it's kind of embarrassing. Any of you grow up eating paper? You know, about 10% of people will eat paper at least once in their life. You know, you put a little molasses on it. It's not too bad, Mitch. You can't knock it. All right, Isaiah is going to help us out. He ate scrolls. Hey. He says, Ezekiel. Any other answers? Owen, we got a couple young men over here, but I'm going to let a few answer, just get some variety here. He ate scrolls. Jeremiah. Jeremiah, all right. We've got uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Any other answers that you want to? Okay, right here up front. D. Another Jeremiah. Okay, we're feeling very Jeremiah-ish today. Anyone else? You all know the answer to this? There's two, actually. Ezekiel and John both were told in vision to eat scrolls. Now, I don't know if you say, well, that doesn't count. If it happens in vision, it doesn't count. Toby, Owen, thank you guys very much. You can uh, set the mics on the front pew here. That would be fine. Um, but they did the act as though it was real, and sometimes it's hard to know in visions and dreams exactly what is happening in, uh, in, in just a dreamlike state versus what's real, like Peter in his trance uh, in, in the book of Acts when he sees the sheet come down, whether that was a real thing. Even Paul in his uh, writing says, I'm not sure if God took me to heaven or if I just saw a vision of heaven. Uh, he says that in 2 Corinthians. So um, uh, sometimes visions can be quite real and lifelike. So in at least two occasions, prophets were told to eat scrolls. Well, of course, we're talking about you are what you eat. And you know, although it's not as common in the Bible, we know throughout the scriptures, we're supposed to have the word of God in our heart, right? Or, you know, to treasure his word in our heart. Um, uh, and we're supposed to have his word in our mind. We're supposed to memorize it. It's supposed to be the, the you know, what we teach our children. But you know, the Bible also teaches that the Word of God is to be in our bodies. We're, to, we're, 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 in, we're told that we are to consume 
the Word. How sweet are your words, uh, it says here in the Psalms, and I uh, apologize, the slide kind of got messed up. How sweet are your words to my taste, yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Another place here, Jeremiah said, your words were found, and he doesn't say, and I memorized them, or I believed them, or I committed them to my heart. Jeremiah literally says, when I found your words, I ate them. I ate your words, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. This whole concept of consuming the Word of God is not just a, a random vision in some offside uh, you know, prophet that did it. It's actually somewhat of a theme throughout the Bible. A couple, a couple other uh, passages that we're familiar with. Job says, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. If I had to choose between having the Word of God in my body, I would choose that more than I would even choose breakfast. If I had to choose between oatmeal and the Word of God, well, in that case, I probably would take the Word of God. I'm not a big oatmeal fan. But that's what Job is saying. This is more important. There is more sustaining nutrients to my life, not just spiritually even. They're talking about their whole being being sustained by having the Word of God in their bodies. Again, not just your heart, your mind, and, and you know, thinking like that, but in a physical transformational way, having it in their bodies. One more passage that we're very familiar with, when Jesus was tested in, during his wilderness uh, temptations. The devil comes to him and says, I can see you're hungry. Simple solution, make some bread. Just turn whatever you want. You're God, turn it into bread. And Jesus, understanding that that was not part of God's plan and not what God wanted for him, he rebuked him. And he said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He literally says, it is not the bread of this world that is going to provide for me. It's when I trust in God and it's his word dwelling inside of me as though it were food. I can survive with God and with his word and with his blessing and the food is secondary. So this theme, this idea of being consuming the word and you are what you eat is found in a variety of places. As a matter of fact, it is a bigger issue in the Bible than sometimes we give it credit for. Sometimes when you think about the process of eating, it's easy to think it's just about biology. You know, we have all these biological factors. We sleep, uh, we breathe, we have an immune system, we grow, you know, we eat, we consume, uh, and it's just biology. It's just how God made us. It's just what keeps us alive. And there's really not much more. Yeah, there's maybe a few analogies here and there that we can learn from about how we grow and sleeping is this and breathing is that. But it's basic biology. But throughout the Bible, the, the uh, element of eating is much deeper than that. And by the way, we're not going to get into all of it, but this is a little bit of a preview of things you may hear in future messages regarding this discipline and this idea of being what you eat. When you think about some of the major moments in the, uh, in the period of God's people and some of the times that happened to them, it's interesting the common pattern and theme you have of challenges regarding eating. And just think about this for a moment. When, Eve, when, when sin first came onto planet earth, it was because someone ate something that God said, don't eat. Right Now, there was more to it than that. There was the spirit of rebellion, there was the decision, there was the pride, there was the deception. But at the end of the day, God said, I have provided for you what you need. Here is what you need. Don't go to this over here because you don't need that. Don't eat it. And, I, and by the way, this is not a, a, about clean and unclean foods or anything like that. There was nothing unclean about the fruit coming from that tree. It was about acting on the, uh, what God had asked them to do or not. Jesus Christ could have turned that, bread, that, that stone into bread. Sure, he did miracles all the time. It had nothing to do with whether or not he could do that as whether it was part of God's plan for him to do that or not. And when Eve ate that first moment, that was the time that sin came into the, into the world. So that was the challenge. The first challenge the children of Israel would have in the Exodus when they come out of the, uh, the, the Red Sea and they're in the wilderness, the very first challenge they have is, what are we going to eat? And when they start to, to, to lo uh, love the idea of going back to Egypt, it's not that they say we love the climate in Egypt or they had better schools or we like the dental plan that they gave us. It was that they had the succulent foods that we want. We're tired of this manna. The issue, the challenge, the primary and driving challenge for the wilderness generation 
uh, of the Exodus generation was about food. We're being challenged about what we eat and how we eat it. And then even in Babylon with Daniel and his friends, the very, before the golden statue, before the lion's den, before dreams get interpreted, the very first challenge for the people of God in Babylon was about food. And do we eat from the king's table or not? Are you seeing a pattern here? The first challenge in the garden, what are you going to eat? The first challenge in the Exodus, what are you going to eat? The first challenge in literal Babylon, what are you going to eat? And now this doesn't just end there, and we could go through more examples, even in the New Testament. When Jesus is baptized, and he becomes the spiritual fulfillment of what the, the children of Israel failed to do, he comes through the waters, and he goes into his wilderness of fasting, and the devil says, I got this. I was able to trip up the first Adam and his bride in the area of eating. Of course, I'm going to try the same thing with the second Adam and his bride. I'm going to be able to trick the Son of Man into doing something against the will of God by eating something. The first temptation of Christ was a challenge over eating. In the early church, as Jesus has barely been in heaven, Jesus, the church is in his infancy in the book of Acts. Jesus has hardly set up residence in the holy temple up in heaven yet, Mitch. And already the issue in the church was over eating. In Acts chapter 6, the very first challenge to the church was, why are the certain Jews getting food and other Jews not getting food? There was a racial uh, division there, and it had to do with food. And then even in the book of Revelation, the very first letter to the church of Ephesus, the concluding remark of the angel to, the, to the, John the Revelator was, to him who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, he shall have the right to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And then you go right to the seventh church, to Laodicea. And at the end of that, which is a span of time from the time of John to the second coming, so in our day, in Laodicea, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in with him and do what? Play Nintendo? Are we going to build a house? What are we going to do? Watch movies together? No, Jesus says, I'm going to come in and we're going to eat together. The spiritual nature of eating is far more deeper than just biology. There is so much more to it. Eating is a gift from God. Amen? Amen. You know, God didn't have to give you taste buds. He didn't have to. He didn't have to make the process of eating pleasurable. I mean, it, it could have been so much different. But God has provided as many variety of tastes as there are colors uh, on the spectrum, as there are flowers in the field or fish in the sea. An apple does not taste the same as a tomato. And a tomato does not taste the same as corn. And that doesn't taste the same as uh, watermelon or whatever you want. The variety of appetite and flavors, God wants us to enjoy eating, and He builds into that spiritual lessons for our lives. Eating is spiritual, emotional, and personal. Now again, I'm not, gonna, I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian. I'm not going to get into all of those factors. There's great depth of Bible study in all of those. How many of you are emotional eaters? When you're happy, you eat. When you're sad, you eat. When you're bored, you eat. <laughs> Whatever's going on, you celebrate, you eat. Right? That's the American way, I tell you. We love to use food as markers of what's going on in our life. Right? Eating is, 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 is so much part of our world, and God understood that. God designed it. God wanted it to be a blessing. God wanted us to see greater purpose in it. He knew we would need a deeper understanding. Eating in the Bible is a symbol of worship. It is a symbol of worship. One of the primary things we do as a church is we eat a meal together at the Lord's table, right? And maybe you've even heard this kind of idea of you are what you eat at a communion service. That's a common place where the pastor will say, now as we partake of the bread and the wine, we are becoming, we're taking into our bodies these symbolic representations of the character of Jesus Christ. We're taking the broken body of Jesus into us so that it would provide us strength and the grace of his blood being spilt as a blessing of forgiveness in our life, right? So in so many factors all throughout Scripture, we could go on and on and on how eating is a, a, a major element of our spiritual journey and our physical journey as well. But I want to come to Revelation. We've been in Revelation here recently. 
Um, Pastor John did a week of prayer on Revelation. We had a, a service here where he went through the whole book. Um, the young adult class, they've been studying the book of Revelation, and I've been preaching from Revelation as of recent. And there's a lot of things happening in the, in the world today that is drawing people to study prophecy, drawing people to study Revelation. And so I want to continue on that, and I want us to look at this very interesting passage in Revelation 10 uh, to see what we can learn from it. So come to the end of the, the book of, uh, or the chapter 10 of Revelation. John has this vision, and he sees all these things happening. We don't have time to, to describe it all. But in vision, he says, Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. All throughout Revelation, there's been this book or scroll that has been being opened slowly over time. The seals have been being broken. And finally, we come to chapter 10, and this angel is holding this open book this powerful book that is now revealed, that is now available, that is now accessible. It had been closed, it had been sealed, it had been a ministry or a mystery, but now it's open. And the angel says, take that book that's in the hands of the angel, and he's standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, and I told him to give me the little book. And he said, take it and eat it. I wonder if he was expecting that. <laughs> take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it'll be as sweet as honey. Now again, this is a, a repeat of a similar uh, vision that Ezekiel had had earlier in Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3, where Ezekiel was given that same thing. So you have all these uh, tie-ins with the Old Testament, and you have to see the, the context and what it means. But this whole idea that John was told here in the book of Revelation, as the, re as the revealing of Jesus Christ is slowly being opened, and he's told to eat this book. He says, it's going to make your tummy bitter, but you're going to like what it tastes like in your mouth. It's going to be like honey. So I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it. And in my mouth, it was sweet as honey, and when I'd eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. So everything the angel said happened. It tasted good in the mouth, but when it, once it made its way into the stomach, it made its way into the body, a bitterness was sensed. And that was intended. That was predicted. And then the angel said, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now, there are a, mil, a myriad, maybe, maybe I should put it that way, of ways that you can analyze and interpret and apply this passage. And, and you can look at it from a historical perspective and a, a theological perspective and prophetic and all that's fine. I want us today, though, to look at it from a personal perspective, a personal perspective. A lot of times when we read the Bible, we see what happens, and we, we may appreciate it. We may even understand it, but we put a distance between ourselves and the story, and we say, I'm so glad Jesus died on the cross, and I don't have to. He did it for me. Now, that's true, but if we distance ourselves too far, we forget that Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must take up his own cross and deny himself and follow me. So yes, Jesus died on the cross, but we have our own cross to bear, right? I'm so glad that Jesus divided the fish and the loaves. Jesus did the miracle, and so he provides for me, and I don't have to worry about it because he provide. Well, yes, he did, but what did he do with the fish and loaves after he divided it? He gave it to his disciples to distribute. So you can't distance yourself too much and say, well, Jesus did it, so I don't need to worry about it. No, Jesus did it so he could give it to you to share it. I'm so glad Jesus walked on the water so he, he can walk on the water. Now I don't have to worry about, I don't have to worry about uh, overcoming obstacles and, and allowing the, because Jesus did it for me. Yes, he did. But Jesus also invited Peter, step out of the boat. Join me in this journey. So what I'm saying to you this morning is don't distance yourself too much from these stories and say, well, I'm glad John ate the scroll because I don't have to. John ate the scroll as an example that we too, church, we too need to eat the prophecy. We too need to eat the scroll. We too need to eat what God has provided for us. This is not just something to say, well, that was an application in history that happened during the, you know, the, uh, the mid-1800s and, and with the Advent movement, and, and it's all over in the past. I'm glad I understand it, but it's all in the past. It doesn't really apply. I don't have to do anything about it. That is not a good way of, of using Scripture at all. This is an example. I want to make a personal application. This is an invitation to all of us. 
To all of us, God holds his book, and he says, I want you all to take it and eat it. Now, don't tear your pages out right now, okay? Let's, uh, let's look at this just a little bit. You are what you eat. Already we understand that we've already been instructed in the Bible, in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day how often our bread? It, it says it right there. You got it. Very. You're in advanced class today. I can see that. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus has already instructed his disciples, already instructed the believers that we are to be consuming the bread of life, the truth of Jesus Christ, the scriptures on a daily basis. So this is not a, 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 a random thought that we should be eating the scroll and it's never been taught before. Jesus has made it clear from the very beginning that when our, in our regular prayers, we are to ask God, give us our daily bread. We need to be consuming this every day. And, but it's more than what you've... Uh, I mean, the, the, the challenge I have with this is for a lot of people who've heard this type of thing before. Okay, yes, I'm supposed to have the scriptures in my mind. I'm supposed to eat them. They're supposed to be in my body. Wonderful. But I think we sometimes miss the point. And I don't want... I have, my message this morning is actually very simple. Very, and even Dennis will understand it. I'm pretty sure. I'm going to try to simple it down for everyone. But it's actually really, really simple. And, but I think it's something that we miss often when we're applying different elements to our life. Scripture must become a part of you. When you eat, you are what you eat, right? When you consume Scripture, not just in your mind, not in your heart, but in your very being, you are becoming Scripture. Meaning... You become Scripture. You are what you eat. When God told John to eat the scroll, it was not just about John understanding the scroll, which is Daniel, by the way, in case any of you are worried about what we're getting at. That is the book of Daniel, but it's more than the book of Daniel. It is all the tie-ins that Daniel makes throughout the Old Testament Scriptures. It's not just about understanding or having confidence in what God is saying. It's that you yourself are becoming Scripture. Now, what in the world does that mean? By the way, this is not outside of, of, of the biblical nature and uh, uh, other places where even Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, he tells them, look, I'm writing a letter to you, but I'm writing it so that you will become the letter that other people will read. You see what he's saying? I'm giving you what God has given me in the epistle so that as you read it, you yourself become the epistle to others. You see? When we consume the Word of God, it is not just about the benefit it brings us it's the transformation that we ourselves become the message of God to the world. Let me put it another way. When we eat the book, a lot of us think, oh, it's going to help us survive the last days. I want to survive the last days. I don't want to be caught up in the deception of the devil. I don't want to be among those who receive the mark. I don't want to get into any problems or anything like that. I want to survive. And if I eat the book, I'll survive the last days. If I eat the book, I will understand the last days. Now, don't get me wrong. That's a fine thing. And we want to be able to uh, have confidence and courage that as we go through the trials, as we go through the, the temptations and the challenges, we want to be able to stand on the word just like Jesus did when the devil came to him. If you're a child of God, then you're going to do this. I don't need you to tell me who, who, if I'm a child of God or not. I know that I'm a child of God. That's what Jesus said to the devil. Well, if you're the son of God, then you'll do this. And the devil's going to do the same thing to us. And Jesus stood firmly on the scriptures. Amen? So we are going to want to know the scriptures, and we're going to want to have confidence. But it's more than that. When we eat the book, it's so that we can be the message that we have now consumed, read and understood by all men. Um, Right after John eats the book, the very next statement is, 
you now are to prophesy. You now have become the message that you've consumed. You now are the Word of God because you've just consumed it. Why we want to consume the Word of God is not just or even primarily for our own personal benefit. Now, I got it. I understand Daniel better than you do. I'm going to make it a few more weeks into those last days, Mitch. I understand the prophecies. I know all the nations that rose and fell. I know who the Ottoman Turks were. I know all. I got it. That's not the point of eating the book. Eating the book means you now literally in your very being are the message of God to others. You must now prophesy again to many peoples, languages, tongues, and kings. It has been said, oh, I will not want to go there yet. It has been said that there are five Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. Very few people read their Bibles today. Very few. But people are reading you. They're reading you when you drive. They're reading you in the grocery store. And we're not talking about judgmentalism. We're not talking about criticism. It's just natural. They're reading you. What message are they getting? Are they getting the gospel when they read you? Or are they getting you? What are they getting? We are the people in the last days consuming God's word and proclaiming God's word and, and confident in the movement of the Spirit within His people in the last days. But until it comes to the point where we are transformed in our being through consuming God's word, the work will be stalled. The work will not go as far and as quickly as it needs to go. God did not give John that scroll to eat in the last days simply so that John could go, I got it now, it's good for me. I know what's going on. It's so that John could become the message of Jesus Christ. So that John in his being could become the gospel. Because not everyone could read. Not everyone would read. God wants you God wants you to be the message. Yes, always drawing people back. This is, this is not about turning ourselves into some you know, God-like being or anything like that or falling into the temptation of, of hubris or anything like that. But it's allowing the Spirit of God to transform your life. And that can only happen if we are eating our daily bread. Are you what you eat. Are you becoming the gospel? So you, again, as you compare these two messages from Revelation chapter 10, you must prophesy again. You've eaten the word. You've become the word. So allow that to go out to the many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. It is right hand in hand with the great commission of Jesus Christ in Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can only do that by the power of God's transforming grace and allowing the Word to be our complete nourishment and foundation. So as you celebrate, as you gather as family, as you uh, remind yourselves of all the things to be thankful for, as you pray for our country, as you pray for your family, 
make it your mission also as an individual believer to allow him to be your ultimate meal so that you would become the message of Jesus Christ to this world. Where else will the world go if the church fails in this mission? Let's do it together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I'm so glad, Lord, that we can explore this together, that we can uh, look at it from as many perspectives and angles as possible. Try not to overcomplicate things. It just is a, a wonderful reality that we want to apply to our lives, Father. It, it's kind of an interesting analogy, but we can understand it, Father, that we're going to become what we eat. And we want to consume. Yes, we want it, your, your word in our mind. We want your spirit in our heart. We want your character to be developed in us. But we want it to be a holistic experience that goes from head to toe. We want to be able to stand on your truth as Jesus did, as, as uh, the, the, the prophets and apostles did, standing and being transformed by your word so that we can be effective witnesses for you in the last days. Father, help us in this endeavor. Continue to be with our families as we, uh, again, gather for these meals and the holiday and, and all the uh, uh, festivities that are happening, Lord. And God, just continue to build your church and build your people. We are what we eat. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath. It looks like the rain has uh, stopped, so maybe we'll be able to get outdoors a little bit this afternoon. But I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving. Happy Sabbath.